listen, that's a kind of Shema thing. God is constantly saying in the Bible to all of us, and particularly to Israel, his chosen nation, who have not done very well. They actually killed their own Messiah. But he still goes on pleading. And he says, listen to this, house of Jacob. Jacob, of course, is the other word for Israel. Same, same idea, same person, who are named Israel. They have this name of Israel, which really means working with God, ruling with God. That's what Israel is designed ideally to be. If you're the Israel of God, the international church, you're supposed to be working with God. And Israel, the nation, has failed very badly to do this, actually wound up killing their Messiah when God sent Jesus. And they came, these people, their history was from the waters of Judah, the people of Judah, and they swear by the name of the Lord. They claim allegiance to God, and they invoke the God of Israel. That's the one God of the Shema, the one God of Israel. But they're not doing it in truth or in righteousness. That awful word righteousness simply means doing things right rather than wrong. They name themselves after the holy city. They swear by Jerusalem. They say that they're leaning on the God of Israel, but they're not actually genuine. That was the complaint that Jesus had with the Pharisees and scribes of his time. They claim to be representing God, but they had turned religion into a nightmare. So just leaning on the God of Israel is pointless unless you are really believing the truth of that God of Israel. And one of God's names is the Lord of the armies of heaven. That's his name. That's to say that his function, not nothing to do with how to pronounce the name in Hebrew. The point of a name in the Bible is it tells you everything about who a person is. Well, God is the God of all the angelic armies of heaven. And he's so smart, he's so much in advance of all us, of us, that he was able to declare former things long ago. You can't do that. You're not smart enough to predict the future. They went out of God's mouth. He predicted them. God predicted the whole of world history from the very start. If you're God, you can do that. And it puts God in a very superior position. So we shouldn't claim to be at his level at all. God then says in verse three, suddenly I acted. I got, I brought to pass what I predicted. I told the people in advance that Cyrus, who is called the Messiah, a Messiah, would attack Babylon and free the people. That was a pattern an example of a yet future, further, final, great deliverance of Israel from a future Babylonian system that's going to attack it. So God is repeating it. It's very clever. The Bible, as I've said to you before, is very good economically because it can say one thing and mean the same thing in, the, in future patterns. The artist to see those patterns. I know, God says, and let's apply this to ourselves, if that's necessary, and I'm sure it is in many cases, I know you're obstinate. I know your neck is an iron tendon, you're stiff-necked. I know your forehead, that's the seat of the mind. Your forehead is the access to your thinking, is like bronze, very firm and impenetrable. Therefore, God says in verse 5, I declared all these things long ago, so you would be marveling at when they actually came to pass. Before they took place, I, God, proclaimed them to you so that you wouldn't be tempted to say, my idol has done them. So the Bible is the story of man's failure to worship the true God, man's preference and stubborn choice to worship his own idols. And your idol doesn't have to be a piece of china that you put on your mantelpiece. It can be anything that you value so highly. It could be a sport, it could be a singer, it could be a film star, all sorts of things that you value more highly than you do God. My carved image, my idol, my cast metal image have commanded them. Don't tell God that what you consider to be gods are really greater than he. So the Bible is full of this sort of appeal to us then to get a proper sense of our own position in relation to him. You have heard, look at all this. And you, will you not declare it? Can you do this predicting that I, God, can do? Of course you can't. 
I, God, proclaim to you new things from this time. And that's what we're reading today. We're reading about new things that are going to happen in the Middle East, in the world before Christ comes back. God predicted all that. But don't you dare say then in verse 7, behold, I knew them. You didn't. You didn't know that. You wouldn't know about this future Assyrian Babylonian Antichrist system in the Middle East yet to arrive in full form. You wouldn't know about that if the Bible hadn't predicted it. You have not heard in verse 8. You have not known. Even from long ago, your ear has not been open. You're deaf as a people. God speaks to all of us. And you are potentially very stubborn, potentially very deaf. And so we apply all of that to ourselves. For the sake of my name, my purpose. The word name in the Bible has nothing to do with how to pronounce the Hebrew name Yahweh, Jehovah. That's absolutely not what that means. My name means everything to do with God's character and his plan and his purpose. For the sake of my great world purpose, I delay my wrath. God is holding back his wrath, but that wrath is going to break forth. And as I said to you earlier, John the Baptist and Jesus in announcing the gospel of the kingdom, which is where all religion begins, that gospel of the kingdom is a threat and a promise. A threat that if you don't repent, you're in bad trouble. And a promise that if you do repent, the glory of your future life is just incomparable. So I want to turn to one little passage in Isaiah, which I think summarizes our stubbornness, our tendency to be, tendency to be, to be stubborn. And so we're there in uh, Isaiah 29, 21. This verse strikes me as very powerful. It talks about people who defraud the one in the right with meaningless arguments. Isn't that powerful? This is a very bad position to be in. If you cause a person to be criticized or indicted or judged or condemned by a word, and you set a trap for the arbitrator at the gate, and you defraud the one in the right, with meaningless arguments. You're proving that you're a very bad judge. God is picking out the judges, the magistrates, the managers of a future brilliant political system that's going to actually work. That's in the kingdom of God to come. God is picking them out. And you want to be on the right side of that judgment, that selection process. And you're on the wrong side of that selection process. If you're defrauding somebody who's in the right, with meaningless arguments. So get some learning, get some instruction, and make sure that your arguments are true and right. Then you will qualify to be a co-manager, a co-administrator, a co-supervisor, if you like, in that wonderful kingdom of God that's coming when Christ returns. That's the whole point of this exercise. You have not heard, you have not known, your ears not been opened. That was what got me on to stressing that our ears need to be open to truth. I knew, God says to this evil system, I knew that you would deal very treacherously and you have been called a rebel from birth. That's our tendency. We are rebels. We're thick, stubborn, and not open to truth. And so we need to pray all the time, oh God, give me a spirit of truth, a teachable spirit. Then in nine, for my sake, I delay my wrath. That, that it is. I'm delay, delaying my intervention, my wrath that's coming at the second coming in order not to cut you off. I'm being merciful. I'm not cutting you off. I'm delaying my wrath. Behold, I've refined you. So we're all being refined. Our tests and trials, it's a common Bible theme. The things that we're going through, sometimes very, very tough, are simply to make us better supervisors, managers in that future kingdom. So all this has point. I'm testing you like gold. Your character is being tested in the furnace of affliction. Imagine a great furnace burning, but it's a furnace of affliction, your troubles. Acts 14.22, through much tribulation, Acts 14.22, I'll refer to it, through much tribulation, we're destined to enter that future kingdom in order to be co-managers with Jesus in that world to come. There it is. I've refined you. So that makes sense of your suffering right now. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. If 
for how can my name be profaned? God is not going to put up with the profaning, treating his name as a swear word, the disregard of God by many people who don't care about God. That time of patience is coming to an end and I will not give my glory to another. What does that mean? I will not give my glory as the one God to another. God is actually going to glorify saints. He already glorified Jesus. So he does give his glory to other people, but not in the absolute sense. I will not give my unique glory as the one and only true God. I will not give that to other members of so-called triune God. I'm not going to put up with that. I'm going to insist on my position as God. Then in verse 12, listen to me, Jacob. More Shema stuff, right? Listen. Listen to me in verse 12. Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I'm he. I'm first. I'm also the last. Isn't that wonderful? I'm the Alpha and Omega. Now, in the book of Revelation, Jesus claims to be the Alpha and Omega also. And the Father claims to be the Alpha and Omega. But there's a huge difference between God, the Father, and the Son. Jesus claims to be the Alpha and Omega who died. So let's get this lesson clear. God cannot die. God is immortal. God cannot die. Jesus died. Therefore, Jesus cannot be God. That's a very easy syllogism for your friends. You ask them very kindly and respectfully, can Jesus die? Well, we all know the Son of God died. Do you equally know that God cannot die? Well, of course, God is immortal. Therefore, Jesus cannot be God. That would make two gods. We don't want two gods. One is enough. I am he. I'm the first. I'm the last. Assuredly, my hand founded the earth. His God then protesting to us foolish human beings. Listen, I made everything. My right hand spread out the heavens. Wow. I look at the stars and the moon at night here in beautiful Georgia, and I think this is amazing. It's so much like the Bible. It takes me back to Genesis. When God summons the stars, they stand together. And look at 14. Maybe we should draw it to a close here. Assemble all of you. He's inviting all human beings to listen. If they would only read the Bible daily, large sections of it. Come and listen to what I have to say. The Lord loves him. Here we're back to our original theme of this morning. God is going to carry out his good pleasure against Babylon, this awful commercial religious system that's going to come into full force just before Christ returns and his arms against the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians, same thing. Babylon and the Chaldeans, think of Belshazzar's feast and all of that. All of that's going to happen again when that final Babylon is going to come crashing down. Yes, verse 15. I have spoken, I have called him. I brought him and he will make his way successful. Who's he talking about here? This is his Messiah talking about Jesus ultimately. I have spoken through my ultimate son, my ultimate Moses. And you know the prophecy that Jesus is the second Moses and God put his words into the mouth of his second Moses. And so here, the positive side of the story, come near, listen to this. From the beginning, I've not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me in his spirit. This is obviously the Messiah speaking or a prophet. It wouldn't matter. Somebody other than God, sudden switch of pronouns here. Now the Lord God, the one God of Israel has sent me, I, the messianic figure being described here. Sometimes the pronouns have to be worked out. They're not very straightforward, but the Lord God has sent me. That's Cyrus who was a Messiah, ultimately Jesus, who is the Messiah. And God's Spirit has sent them. That's God in his operational presence and power, not a third person in a triune God, never. Spirit never worships, never is prayed to, but God's Spirit is God in action. And God in action has sent all the Messiah, Cyrus, and ultimately Jesus. So I think we should finish around here, Carlos. Maybe one more verse here. This is what the Lord says. He was your redeemer. Your redeemer is the one that buys you back from the slave market. We are, as uh, unconverted, before we become Christians, we're so many slaves in the slave market. 
Well, God, through Jesus, allowing his son to die for us, has brought us back. And he is the Holy One of Israel. I'm the Lord your God, I like this verse, who teaches you to benefit. He helps you to do well, who leads you in the way you should go. You can hear the pleading, weeping heart of God here. If only you'd paid attention, Shema, to my commandments. Oh, that you had listened to what I have to say. Then your well-being, your shalom, your fullness and health, wholeness would have been like a river. And your righteousness, your being right rather than wrong, will be like the waves of the sea. Isn't that a marvelous verse? If only you would listen to me, God says, pleading as a father to his children, then look what would have happened. Your well-being would have been like a river and your descendants would have been like the sand of the sea, multitudes of people, your offspring like grains, and such an abundance there'd be more of you than than uh, sand pieces, bits of sand on, on, on the shore, and your name, your reputation, your fame, if you'd like, would never be eliminated or destroyed from my presence. That's the successful, the upbeat note on which we'll stop this morning, because that's a good place to finish in the glory of the hope of the gospel of the kingdom of God coming. That's where we should end. It's all going to be fine in the end, but don't be surprised that there will be trouble between now and the second coming. Go out from Babylon. So here's the solution. Here's the lesson. Leave that wicked system. Be separate from that wicked system. Flee from the Chaldean Babylonian system. Declare this with a sound of joyful shouting. I love this positive note here. Proclaim this. Send it out to the end of the earth. Say this. The Lord will have redeemed. It's a prophecy. The Lord hasn't done this yet. He hasn't redeemed his servant Jacob. Speaking of national Israel there, but a secondary application would be the final redemption of us Christians who are the international Israel. We're going to be redeemed finally. We're being redeemed. We've been bought back from the slave market. Here's what finally we, we note. They did not thirst. This is the negative side. When he led them through the deserts. He made the water flow out of the rock, a generous God, right? He said, they're thirsty, these people of mine. So he causes a rock to flow with water, splits the rock. And that rock, I will remind you in finishing here, was a type of Christ. Paul said the rock that followed them in the wilderness was a picture, a type, an expression, not the real thing, but an expression, a pattern of the Christ that came later. Well, if you're in Christ, in union with Messiah, then he's a rock which will gush out with water for you. And finally, on the negative side, we'll finish with this one. There's no peace for the wicked. If you're not at peace, then you're in the category of wicked. Yes, you have troubles. You have difficulties, extreme difficulties. All of that, I see it. But there is an ultimate peace in knowing Messiah Jesus as the one and only solution under God of all the problems that every human being encounters.